For those of you who are visiting, we have been in a series of the book of Hebrews. And today we're going to be covering chapters 9 and the first half of chapters 10. And so uh, hopefully for those of you who have been a part of the series, you've gotten a lot out of it. And uh, today is a very special service. You know, the title of today's lesson is There's Power in the Blood. Just like we sang in that song. Yeah, you know, I got a question for you. Who in here likes to go window shopping? You know, it's pretty cool. You know, some, for some of us, that's the only kind of shopping that we get to do, you know? But, you know, you, when you go window shopping, you know, you, you see some things and you go, well, I don't know if that would really work for what I need. And, and then you get to some other things and you look in the window and you go, that's exactly what I want right there. I think I'm going to come back and buy that later. And then you go to some other windows and you just go, there ain't no way, I can't afford that. <laughs> and that's for most of us, a lot of our window shopping. But you know, uh, today we're going to do a little window shopping. Uh, but before we go shopping, I want you to think about a little bit of things. I want you to think about, don't get all down on me, I need you guys to stay engaged with me, all right? I, need, I want you to think about the sin that's in your life, okay? You know, there's sin in your life that you know about, and then there's sin in your life that you don't know about. And that works whether you have a relationship with God, whether you don't have a relationship with God, whether you've been around a long time, or whether you just got baptized. There's sin that you know about, and there's some that you don't. Go to Malachi chapter 3. And you know, in Malachi chapter 3, that's where, that's where most ministers go when they want to help the congregation with their giving. And yet there is a couple of principles in this passage that we've got to pull out for today's lesson, amen? Malachi 3, in verse 6. God says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. See, because if God changed, you'd be all messed up. You'd be like a missing target trying to have a relationship with God. So God doesn't change. It says, ever since the time of your forefathers, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Well, you know, the first principle that we got to pull out of this is very simple. God does not change. And the second principle is that we all turn away from God at times. And God says, when you turn away from me, you've got to return to me. You see, when we were babies, we all started out with God. We were in the presence of the Lord as a young baby. And then at some point, you began sinning and knowing that you were sinning, and you drifted away from God. And the principle is that we all must return back to Him. But how do you do that? That's what we're going to look at today. You know, God doesn't change. And, you know, as we've been going through these studies, studying the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, it can be very easy to get the view, well, that was the Old Covenant, and lots of things changed in the New Covenant. And yet we must wrestle with the principle that God does not change. Many people take the view that God changed somewhere, that he changed his mind on how he was going to do things in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But he does not change. See, there's, there's a couple of things that are the same. Old Covenant, New Covenant. The sin that's in your life, see, the reason why I ask you to think about it, the sin that's in your life creates a debt to God. So every time you commit a sin in your life, it's like you're taking out a loan from God that you got to pay back. And so the second part of that, things that never change, is the debt must be paid. There's no, you, can't, you cannot file bankruptcy in the spiritual kingdom of God. All debts that you have must be paid. And the third is that the payment of the debt must be made through the blood of a sacrifice. See, the sacrifice is blood must be spilled. But the spilling of the blood is not enough. The sacrifice actually has to die for the blood to be worthy of, of atoning for sins. You see, sin in your life makes your conscience. See, you know your soul and your, uncon and your conscience, that's the same thing. Sin makes your conscience unclean and unsanctified, creating a debt to God that must be paid by a sacrifice. See, it was that way in the Old Covenant, and it's still that way in the New Covenant. So today we're going to get a picture of three windows that we're going to shop through, right? Window number one. This is not door number one. It's not a game show, man. 
Window number one, this is, the, this is the thing that you look at and you go, I don't know if that thing's going to work for me. That's the old covenant. That's the picture of priests walking through the earthly tabernacle. And we're going to read about that in a minute. That's the old covenant. We're going to come to find that under the old covenant, everybody walked around with guilty consciences. You ever had a guilty conscience? You ever done something really bad and you knew it was really bad and you didn't tell anybody about it and you tried to hide it? And then every day, day after day after day, you walked around guilty. That's what it was like to be an Israelite. Outwardly clean when the sacrifice was made, but always inwardly unclean. Temporary forgiveness. They used the wrong blood. See, that's the one that's really window shopping because nobody could go into the earthly tabernacle but the priest. Everybody being forgiven had to stand outside and look on on the inside. And they couldn't even actually do that. Window number two. This is the one that looks really good. I think I might come back and buy this one. This is Jesus walking through the tabernacle. The true tabernacle up in heaven. See, Jesus going to God and paying the debt for your sin. It's something that provides a clear conscience. You know, if you've ever had an unclear conscience and felt guilty, you know how awesome it is to get it all out and feel free again. To be inwardly clean. See, Jesus provides that eternally for each one of us, if we'll take it. He, used, he is the right blood. And yet, when he walks into the tabernacle, he's not alone. When the number three is the one we can't afford. We'll look at that one at the end. You see, in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, God was not changing. He was showing us what things would be like if we did all the right things, but didn't have the right heart. And so, that was the purpose of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in God's plan. And you all know what it looks like when you do the, the right thing with the wrong heart, right? That's when you have that talk with somebody who made you really angry. And when you walk away, you go, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then as you walk away, you walk away with your attitude. And that's what life as an Israelite was like. Is you do all the right things, but the heart would never be there. And it was all about blood. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 and begin, amen? Our first point today, window number one. The powerlessness of the wrong blood. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its room where the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place. They were really awesome with their names, you know. Super creative. See, behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. The ark contained the gold jar of manna. Can you imagine manna that was like 800 years old? But it was still fresh, because that's what happens when you're in the presence of God. The ark contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. So, if they're not going to discuss them, we're not going to discuss them. Man. We'll just move right on. This is where we get the first picture, what you see in the first word. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year. Boy, that would really stink if you could only be forgiven of your sins once a year. Guilty conscience for the whole rest of the year. It, it says, but only the high priest entered in the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood. I guess the blood's pretty important if he never went into the room without it which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. 
This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to cleanse the conscience of the worship. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Y you know, we come to find that priests never entered the most holy of holies without blood to atone for sins. See, it was that way in the old covenant, but it's that way in the new covenant as well. You, you know, blood is very essential. So I want to have a little chat about blood. You know, I'm going to read a little something that I read. It says, blood is the red fluid that contains a complex mixture of cells suspended in a liquid matrix, which is transported to almost every part of the body through a network of blood vessels called the circulatory system. It's propelled by the heart, delivering oxygen and other important nutrients to all the organs and tissues of the body, right? Well, at the same time, cleansing the body from waste. In order for blood to carry out its functions, it needs to touch every living cell and tissue in our body. Thus, it is the fluid of life, a vital force that all human beings need in order to live and sustain. No doubt, God created us physically to need blood. And there's no coincidence that the very thing that's needed physically for us to live is also needed spiritually for us to live. You see, what's co what, what goes through all those arteries and blood vessels is comprised of what we take into our lives. The air that we breathe, the food that we eat, and what we drink. That's how the nutrients get in throughout every cell. Without that, cells and tissues in our body would die. It distributes oxygen and all the things that we need to survive. But it also transports out of all the organs all the gunk. You see, because when you breathe bad stuff in, if you don't get it out, you're going to die. And so blood also transports dissolved gases and toxins and all of that through our lungs and through our urinary system to get rid of all the waste that would cause us to die. It also regulates things in our bodies. It regulates the level of acidity in our blood. And the different organs and tissues can't have levels of acid that are too high. So it actually regulates that. The other thing that many people don't know is it actually regulates our temperature. I know Jen knows all this because she's a nurse. She had to study all this. But the blood gets heat from all the muscle tissues. When you're working out and stuff, and, you, and all the heat that's created, the blood actually transports that heat all throughout the body to keep you warm. And lastly, the blood protects us, protects us from injury. When we get cut, the platelets actually form clots, let us heal over, and let the cuts go, or else we just bleed to death every time we get cut. You see, but what would happen if you got an injection of the wrong blood? See, that's the problem with window number one, is it's the wrong type of blood. And so by, by, by going by the old covenant, the blood of goats and calves, or by not understanding the new covenant, you don't get the right blood. And it can't do what it needs to in your life. And, and what blood does for us is it gives us, the blood of Jesus gives us a clear conscience. That's what the right blood does for your life. Imagine those days when you walked around with a guilty conscience. Those are horrible days. And so the blood of Jesus has a vital part in our life so that we can actually live life to the full. That takes us on to window number two, the power of the right blood. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 11. It says, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater tabernacle, the more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. See, this is the picture of the second one. The first one you saw the priest walking through the earthly tabernacle. Now you get to see Jesus going up to the heavenly tabernacle. It says, but he did, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, 
having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial unclean sanctify them so that they were out. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom, to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of one who made it. Because a will is enforced only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. You see, the old covenant was a will. And the only way the will could go into effect is if somebody died. This is where we learn that the blood itself isn't enough. The death of the sacrifice must take place as well, or the will of the new covenant cannot come into effect. Since this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to the people, he took the blood of calves, together with water, scarlet, wool, and branches of hyssop, and he sprinkled the scroll and all the people. Can you imagine coming to church? The priest makes up all this concoction of blood and hyssop and everything, and he's got all the articles so that he can help forgive your sins, and he sprinkles it all with blood, and then he walks up to you and he goes, and he throws blood all over you. It was awesome to be part of the first century church. Being Israelite was fun, you know? But he said, you know, if, if, if all of that stuff helped forgive sins for the moment, how much more the blood of Jesus under the new covenant? He says here in verse 20, he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood of both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremony. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Now, here's a very important principle that you have to get in. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See, blood is essential. Without blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And we're going to talk a little more specifically about that later. But it says in verse 23, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now, here's the real picture of the second window. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood that is not his own, the wrong blood type. Then Christ would have had to suffer many things, many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice by himself. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. You see, this is the second window. Watching Jesus sacrifice himself and through death enter in to the heavenly tabernacle. And this is where we got to talk about spiritual blood. I took the comparison of physical blood and I compared it to the blood of Jesus, and this is what I came up with. The spiritual fluid of life, the blood of a sacrifice with the right blood type, works just like the physical fluid of life. In order for this blood to carry out its function, the sacrifice from which it came must die, and its blood must be transfused into the unsanctified soul. The blood must be circulated and propelled through the life of every unsanctified heart through faith. Faith allows the blood to be sprinkled on and touch every part of a person's life. so that this unclean soul may be in the presence of God. See, that's the importance of blood. 
without the blood, there can be no forgiveness, and none of us could be in the presence of God. See, it achieves its purpose, delivering the spiritual food of life. It delivers a new purified life, a new attitude, and a clear conscience. It cleans the life of the wastes and toxins and exports them out through the forgiveness of sins. See, this is the spiritual food of life, a vital force that all human beings need in order to have forgiveness of their sins and to perpetually be in the presence of God on earth and in heaven. You see, your spiritual blood is comprised of what you take in at the same time. What you watch on TV, what you look at on the internet, what you choose to talk about. It distributes all through every area of your life a clear conscience to every area of your life. See, it's your faith that transports the blood into your unsanctified body. Jesus' blood literally washes all of your sins that cause the conflict and strife in your life and it infects your attitude with spiritual toxins. It regulates. It actually regulates the acidity of your attitude and the acidity of your actions. See, the blood of Jesus regulates whether you're harsh or whether you're gentle. Whether you say a kind word or whether you're critical. Whether you cross your arms or give a hug. It also provides protection just like physical blood. Spiritual platelets called the Holy Spirit. Cleanse your life by when you get cut emotionally, you get damaged spiritually. It has a clotting effect that heals all your wounds. See, but what blood type you receive is a matter of life and death. See, if you get sick or injured physically, can anyone donate blood to you? No, it's the same way with spiritual things. Only Jesus' is blood. Only the blood of a perfect sacrifice can cleanse your sins. And all believers are be positive. Belief positive. You, you know... I remember when I was six years old, I got baptized. And, and you know, my baptism was for fun. I saw everybody up there in the baptismal, and it was kind of raised up over the, over the stage, and I'd see everybody go down and get baptized, and they'd come up all happy and everything, and I was like, I want to do that. And, and so I went to the minister, and he said, oh, you want to be baptized? Yeah. You believe in Jesus? Yeah, I know, I know all my verses from, from all the children's classes. I, was, I, always, I always got all the pins and everything. And, and then, you know, he took me up there, and I had the robe on, and, and the robe kind of looked like this. It was all long and everything, you know. And, and they took me up there, and they baptized me. And, and for many years, you know, I, I felt like I had a relationship with God. I had no urgency to get close to God because I was already close to God. But it was a funny thing. My life was messed up. Because when you get the wrong blood type, what it does is it takes away your ability to see where you're at with God. Because you're not in His presence. See, the power of the right blood is that you get to be in the presence of God. Now, I've made a handout for you guys today as we go to our third point. As we look at window number three, the guys are going to give you a handout. Because there's a third picture of what I want you to see. The first picture we talked about the earthly tabernacle, watching the priests, you know. The priests go up into the first room and they cleanse everything with blood and all that. And, and then they go into the, the most holy place and they go into the presence of God. And you sit outside and wait while they make atonement for your sins. And you're like, are they done yet? Am I forgiven yet? And then the priest comes out and Okay, now I'm good. And, and then we get the picture of Jesus. And Jesus is walking through the heavenly tabernacle. He was crushed on the cross. He spilt his blood. And through his death, he entered in the heavenly tabernacle. But the thing about that tabernacle is Jesus wasn't alone. There was somebody with him. 
And, and so our point number three is window number three, the window you can't afford. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, they would not have stopped being offered. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilt for their sins. You know, when you have the right blood type, you no longer have to feel guilt in your life for the sins you've committed. That's an amazing thing. The church said, it says, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. See, the old covenant, you know what it was good for? It was good for helping you to know just how sinful you were. Every year you got to be reminded of how sinful you were. See, that's what communion was like for them. It was a somber time, so sinful. I can't wait for this priest to get done with this thing so I can feel it. Just sitting in guilt with the wrong heart, doing all the right actions. It says, but those sacrifices were an annual reminder of sins. Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. You've got to have the right blood to See, God hadn't changed in what he required for forgiveness of sins. They were just using the wrong blood to it says, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With bird offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. And that's the attitude of every true Christian. The attitude of every true Christian is to come to do the will of God. He says, then I said, here I am. I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made whole through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Because it's the wrong blood type, from the wrong sacrifice, given with the wrong heart. It says, but when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. You notice, none of, you never hear about the other priests sitting down. You know why? Because their work was never done. Because everybody was always guilty and those sins were actually ever forgiven, forgiven. They were continually having to do the things to forgive sins again and again and again. But Jesus' sacrifice, the right blood type, just did it once. Then he gets to go sit down because his work is done. Since that, since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made a footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. See, no longer will they just do the right things with the wrong hearts. Written on their heart will be the truth. And what they do will come from their hearts. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where there, these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. See, like it said in Malachi, we started out with God, but sin created a debt that needed to be repaid. Your soul must be sprinkled with the blood of a perfect sacrifice. And so you ask, so how do I return to him? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. In, in chapter 9, verse 22, he says very clearly, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so we know that forgiveness comes through the shedding of blood. But that's not enough. Because you could kill, you could slice an animal open, but if it didn't die, it was not a sacrifice. 
So just spilling blood doesn't do anything. It's not enough. The only way to have your debt to God paid is to participate yourself in the death, burial, and resurrection of the sacrifice. So how's that happen? You know, where do I participate in this journey? Well, there's two other good questions. I'm glad you asked those. Go to Acts chapter 2. Keep your place in Hebrews, but go to Acts chapter 2. You guys are asking such great questions this morning. It makes my life easy. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter replied, See, because all these people were interested in how to have forgiveness of sins, how to inherit eternal life, how to go into heaven and be in the presence of God. So this is what Peter said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This applies to everybody. Go to Romans chapter 6. How do you participate so that you can have the blood sprinkled on your life? Romans 6, verse 1. What should we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. It's called repentance. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? See, the picture in this window is that Jesus first got crucified on the cross. But then, in order for the, his blood that's spilled to touch you, you've got to die too. And so, we get baptized into his death. Well, let's go on. It says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with Him like this in death, we will certainly be united with Him in His resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So the first picture of this third window is that as Jesus is dying on the cross, so you are dying of your old life. As he's buried into death, you must be buried with him. And as he's raised to go into the heavenly tabernacle, into the presence of God, if his blood cleanses you, you get to go into the tabernacle, be in the presence of God as well. And so, this is how all true believers come into the presence of God. You know, go back to chapter 9, in verse 14. It says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal sacred spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? That's called sin. That's why I asked you to think about all the sin in your life earlier. See, that's what happens. The power of the right blood type is it cleanses your conscience from all of that sin. It wipes away that debt to God. But all true believers know the end of this verse as well. So that they may serve the living God. It's not all about forgiveness of sins. You see, as Jesus walks into, the, as he is resurrected and he walks into the true tabernacle, he walks as the high priest to minister, to do the minister's duties, but he's not alone. He brings with him every true believer into the presence of God. You actually get to walk right into the most holy moments of Jesus. The result is that you get to do any time what only the high priest used to do once a year. Under the old covenant. See, every true believer understands that when you come into a relationship with God, you actually enter into the true tabernacle, just like all the priests. 
Go to First Peter chapter 2. See, Jesus isn't alone in the tabernacle because he takes with him all the priests who will minister in that tabernacle. Chapter 2 and verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are of the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, one thing that people just don't seem to grasp is that becoming a true believer also means becoming a priest. See, only priests get to go into the presence of God. He says, I'm not just going to have one high priest. I'm going to have a whole nation of priests. They will all enter the temple. They will all come into my presence. They will all be able to minister to the needs of a lost world. See, the blood cleaned the priests so that they would go into the tabernacle, not just for their own forgiveness of sins, but to also minister to all others who needed forgiveness of sins and serve as priests under the new covenant. See, this gives us insight into why Jesus says what he says in Mark 1. Let's go over to Mark chapter 1. I always wondered why, when Jesus met his very first disciples, why he said what he said to them. In Mark 1, verse 14, it says, After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. I never knew repentance was good news. It says, as he walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. And I... We'll let you go to heaven and have the forgiveness of your sins. No? That's the book of Dan, right? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the wrong book. No, he says, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. You know, it's a funny thing. When Jesus approached his first disciples, and if you read all the others, he didn't come promising them the forgiveness of their sins. He didn't come promising that they would be in the presence of God. What he said is, I'm going to make you a priest. You come with me, I'm the new covenant. I'm the high priest, but you are all the other priests if you're going to be with me. So you come with me and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And you're going to minister to a lost world. See, he didn't say, come follow me. And, uh, you, can get, you can go to heaven now. You can come to heaven and have a life of peace. He actually said quite the opposite. See, this is why so many people go window shopping. And they get to that window of the true church, and they look in through the window, and they go, oh, I can't afford that. I, I can't afford that. That's just a little too much. That's a little too much commitment. I know what I'm going to have to do to buy that. Oh, yeah. There ain't no way. See, they look at the true tabernacle and realize that being a true believer means being a priest of See, you, you know, the, the, the Israelites, their hearts weren't even right, but you know what? They clamored to be the one that could go into the most holy place, that place of honor, to be in the presence of God just once, just once a year. I want to be the guy that goes in there. And, and yet nowadays we look, and all we see is the responsibility and the hard work that it takes to minister to people. And we go, no, oh, I think I'll go find another church where I don't have to. They tell me all I got to do is pray Jesus into my heart, and I don't have to minister to anybody. And, 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 you know, they focus on the work and the responsibility, and they change their doctrine because they don't see the honor that you have when you're in the presence of God. So what's the power of the blood after baptism? Oh, you're asking such great questions, huh? You know, God doesn't change. And so, many people teach, once you're saved, you're always saved. I'm watching it closely. But we, we know that Hebrews 6 talks about falling away, that those who have been once been enlightened by the truth, if they cannot be brought back to repentance and falling away, that means you can't lose your salvation. And so we go, in the Old Covenant, the sins 
they got forgiven once a year, but then you weren't good once you sinned anymore. Well, you know what? God hasn't changed. You can lose your salvation by changing your lifestyle back and living. There is no once saved, always saved. Now, it's super difficult to do away with your salvation, but it's also super easy. All you got to do is take one sin and keep living it up and not repent. And so, you get to enter the most holy of holies once you die. So you don't have to go through the death, burial, resurrection anymore. But you do have to repent if you want to stay saved. See, this is why Jesus instituted communion in the Last Supper. This is why he said, do this in remembrance of me, because remembrance is supposed to bring repentance in our lives. Go to Revelation chapter 3. We'll close out with the scripture. This is a very popular scripture in the religious community. Revelation 3. See, in Revelation 3 verse 20, the religious community says... Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on the throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on the throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, there's a few problems with this. Praying Jesus into your heart business. You, you know, first of all, this letter is written to people who are already believers. And so the doctrine that many people use for gaining salvation, if you just go one verse earlier, you come to find it's actually the doctrine of keeping salvation. Because in verse 19, he says, To those I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. You see, this is a doctrine of what happens when we've drifted away from God as a true believer. And God says, I'm right here. Jesus already died for your sins, so just be earnest and repent. I'm right there. Pray me back into your heart, and I'll come right back. He says, you've shut me out of your heart. And Jesus already died once. Don't try and make him die again. Just repent. Pray me into your heart. Open the door, and I'll come right by. And so, as a real Christian, you get to be in the most holy of holies, in the presence of God, and just ask for Him to come back into your heart. And He'll come right back on you. But there's a difference between being forgiven and healing. Go to James. We'll go to one more scripture. Go to James, chapter 5. James, chapter 5. See, because, because many of us don't understand the power of the blood. The power of the blood brings forgiveness. And this is why Jesus didn't focus on forgiveness, because it's not the end all if your sins are forgiven. What a horrible life if your sins are forgiven, and yet you're not healed of your spiritual wounds. This is why he gives us relationships with each other. In James 5, in verse 16, the Bible says, Therefore confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other, why? So that you can be healed. You know, there's a difference between being forgiven and being healed. See, under the old covenant, they walked around with guilty consciences, hiding their sin all the time. Under the new covenant, we just get it all out. You know why? Because, okay, we got 76 members in this church right here. We got all the people here. We got the Latin ministry going downstairs. You know, there's 76 priests right here in this building that you can confess your sins to. Now, they can't forgive your sins, but getting it all out in the light, boy, that sure brings healing. And so, you can be forgiven of your sins through baptism, but you'll only be healed of your sins when you get a relationship with all the other priests through confession. So today, as you window shop in the windows of church, I'll just help you out. Choose window number three. Pick window number three. Get the right blood type, the blood of Jesus. 
Be the priest that God called you to be. And join all the other true believers around the world doing the work of the tabernacle, evangelizing this world in our generation. I love you all very much. Have an awesome day.